January 8th, they're taking Umar before the board in Pennsylvania because of the good work he is doing. What is the crime of Dr. Umar Johnson? Helping black parents? Helping black children? Teaching some of us courage? Teaching us to stand up? Giving good, sound advice to parents who the system wants to put on the same type of drugs, Hakeem, as they did you and Marianne Gabaldo's daughter. And Umar is helping them. But it is black folks. It is Uncle Tom's and Auntie Thomasina's, the Coon Patrol. Snail mail and email and phone calling, faxing the board in Pennsylvania. There are people itching by Umar and this school. Umar and the money. And I want to let you know right now, we're going to ask you for some money to support the school. Let's give God a hand clap. Because we're going to move on. We're going to fight on. But black folks calling white people on Umar Johnson. When you ask the triggers, how much money did you give Umar? Because let me tell you, knowing Umar like I do, if you got a copy of the cancel check, or get a receipt or whatever, your debit card, get a receipt, he will refund it if, you, if you, he's not moving fast enough for you. You can hear a rat urinate on Alabama cotton because the ones itching and complaining and writing ain't gave a dime. Do you hear me, family? And so they want to pressure Umar into building this school haphazardly, building it right now, and then it not be done right, and it fall, and then we attack him about that. Rather than allowing the brother to take his time and to do it right. Let's give God a hand clap. Dr. Umar should not feel pressured to do this school just like that. To please his critics who didn't give him any money and ain't going to give him no money. And then if it fails because it was done too quick, because across the country they talking about me, I'm stealing the money. Umar's a millionaire. Umar live in the lap of luxury. They're going to do that anyway. Take your time, Brother Umar, and let's build the Frederick Douglass Marcus Garvey Academy properly so that we can teach these babies love of self and knowledge of self and the art of war. Let's give God a clap. We're welcoming a bad brother. One of the baddest brothers on the planet right now. I was telling Doc earlier today, I don't know who is hated more. Farrakhan or him? I mean, really, really. Pages and pages and YouTube channels, thousands, dedicated to attacking and blasting this man. Tonight, family, how I many you got Facebook, Instagram, Twitter? Tonight, before you go to bed, please go on there. Tell them you saw Umar, you met Umar, you heard him for yourself, and you're down with Umar. And then tomorrow, let us call that board in Pennsylvania and let them know that we support 
Papa, the Prince of Pan-Africanism. Somebody say Black Power. Black Power. Black Power. Black Power. Let us welcome the Prince of Pan-Africanism, Dr. Umar Johnson. Put your hands together for Brother Malik Shabazz, the minister. Put your hands together for the minister, Black Family. Can y'all hear me okay out there? Yeah. One love. Thanks for coming out. And thanks for coming out in the cold. I got one question before I get started, Detroit. Do y'all, do black folks ever get used to the cold? No. Yeah. Oh. Okay, I just needed to know that. I just needed to know that, because I wasn't sure. I asked the same question in Chicago early this week during Tuesday, but I want to thank y'all for coming out in the cold. It means a lot to me, because you didn't have to crawl out that bed. I've been getting so many texts from people who I thought were supporters of mine. They said, Doc, I want to come see you, but it's just too cold. And I said, if I can get out my bed and fly five, 600 miles from Houston, Texas, and get out my bed to come see you, why can't you get out your bed to come and see me, but you my loyal supporters, so give me a hand. Give yourselves a hand. Give yourselves, give yourselves a hand. I, I, I appreciate it, brothers and sisters. It means a lot to me. I am planning to stay in Detroit for about two or three days longer after today because I'm trying to finalize the school hunt. I'm trying to finalize the school hunt. And where we are in the Detroit schools, and I got to tell y'all, Detroit, your city has not been kind to me when it comes to the school search. For a city like this to have so many abandoned buildings, why is it so hard for me to get in and see them? And y'all city is unique because the school district of Detroit, DPS owns schools, and then the city of Detroit owns schools. So when you find a school you like, you got to find out which one of them own it. And although it's easier to get into the schools owned by the city, the schools that are owned by the city are not as in a good a shape as the schools owned by the public schools. But trying to get into to see the public schools is like trying to get into Fort Knox. They, you need 100 pieces of paperwork. I said, I can give you my bank statement to show you I have enough money to purchase it. We have 700000 I can send you that. But then you got to fill this out and fill this out and fill this out. I was this close to buying one of your Catholic schools. I was this close two months ago to buying one of your Catholic schools. And guess what happened? The realtor, a Jewish white man who was working for the Catholics, and I didn't know Catholics had Jews selling their schools, but... He told the Archdiocese of Detroit who I was, and I didn't hear from him ever again. He told me they wanted to see my curriculum. I said, I'm buying a school cash money. This is not a loan from the bank. I am not a charter school. This is an independent purchase. I'm going to give you the money. You're going to give me the deed. That's it. My curriculum. What I'm teaching black children ain't none of your damn business. <laughs> And although none of those Catholic schools was what I was really looking for, I would have settled for it, brothers and sisters, because I was able to afford most of the ones he showed me. And they were in half-decent condition. But once they found out I was the purchaser, they shut me down. Mm. I had a school in uh, Money Earning Mount Vernon, New York, Catholic school. Last year, I was going to lease it. They shut me down when they found out who I was. Mm. So the Catholic schools, which are in much better shape than the public schools, or the schools owned by the city, they're not going to sell to Dr. Umar Johnson. Now, some of you remember the old Aisha Shule building, right? That's one that I'm looking at. I can afford to buy that. But the city is telling me that we just can't sell it to you. You got to put together a proposal and send a proposal to the city. And we have a real estate committee that's going to review your proposal to make sure your usage of the property is in the best interest of the community. And then we take a vote on it, and we have to vote to let you buy the damn school. Mm. I'm letting y'all know this. 
Because not all of you here are supporters of mine. You support coons and con artists. You don't support people who do work. See, I'm in the streets working. You don't want that. You just want to sit on YouTube and watch people talk black. Okay? That's what you want. Some of y'all came here today so you can go back to that coon in L.A. and report what I got to say. But you ain't got to report to him what I got to say, because when I see his ass, I'm going to let him know face to face what I got to say. Okay? But getting back on topic, brothers and sisters, I was in Chicago Tuesday, as I said. And it's a school in Chicago that I can afford that's owned by a private owner. It's not owned by the Catholic Church. It's not owned by the city's public schools. And it's not owned by the municipality of Chicago. That's one in the pocket. But I want to be honest with y'all. I was really gunning for Detroit, and I'm going to tell you why. And it ain't over yet. That's right. Maybe one of y'all know somebody. Maybe one of y'all know somebody who knows the person who runs the school. But if you know somebody who knows somebody, now's your time to put that call in. I can't wait too much longer, and I'm going to tell you why. Because black people have reported me to white folks for the past three years. They've reported me to the IRS. I've been audited. They reported me to go fund me. They shut the page down. They reported me to Facebook. I'm suspended. They reported me to Instagram. I can no longer go live. They reported me to the State Board of Psychology. And so one day from the day, this coming Monday, January 8th, I got to go before Caesar and try to defend why I should, why they should allow me to continue practicing as a certified school psychologist, something I've been doing since 2001. They want to strip me of that because coons have been writing letters and sending emails to white folks saying, he said people are not born gay. He said don't put your kids in special ed. He said ADHD is a fraud. He said Ritalin is crack. He said black men need to marry black women, not fat, nasty white girls. My views are unorthodox and non-traditional. And so they've gotten so many complaints from y'all. And you know what's so bad? Guess where a lot of the complaints came about? It wasn't about my views on homosexuality. Should I say the truth of homosexuality? It wasn't on my views about interracial marriage. Or should I say the truth about interracial marriage? It wasn't on my views on ADHD, or I would call it the truth about ADHD, because I only give you the truth. But so many of the complaints came from my Tuesday morning black parent telephone call. Wow. Are y'all listening to me? Black people was on my Tuesday call, which I used to help y'all for free. Okay? And they would listen to the call, and then they would tape it. And they would send snippets of how I've been helping y'all help your children, and they were sending that to the white man. I lie to you not. And because they were sending it to the white man, the white man is now saying, you were giving out clinical psychological advice, not school psychological advice. Yes, you are a doctor of clinical psychology, but you never applied for your license. And since you don't have your license, you are only limited to give advice about school psychology, special ed issues, behavioral health. But once you start giving out opinions that have to do with clinical issues, you're now crossing your boundaries. And my response to them is going to be, who the hell ain't got a right to their opinion? I thought that was a First Amendment protection. Amen. Amen. See, the problem is because of Dr. Umar Johnson, special ed rates are down in America. Problem is because of Dr. Umar Johnson, so many black parents have wisened up and you stop letting your children get evaluated for crap that can't even be proven to exist. Because of Dr. Umar Johnson, the Wall Street drug companies ain't making enough money no more off that Ritalin. That Concerta ain't cashing in the way it used to. That Prozac and Risperdal and Metadate ain't bringing in the money for the investors like it used to. So they see me as a one-man army that's making it difficult for them to castrate black males politically and economically, and I need to be stopped. And whenever white folks are trying to stop a black man, the best ally they can find is another black man whose ego cannot stand the shine of another black man's success. I'm gonna tell y'all right now, if they take the cert, let them keep it. The way I look at it, Detroit, if Nat Turner could be hanged and dismembered for your freedom, 
if Marcus Garvey could be deported for your freedom. If Dr. King can have his brains blown out on a hotel for your freedom. If Malcolm be, be, can be murdered in front of his daughters for your freedom. If Megan Evans can be shot in the back outside his own home for your freedom. If Emmett Till can be castrated and have his tongue choked out and his eye shot out and his skull split in two for your freedom. What the hell is a white man's piece of paper for your freedom as well, brother? So I'm going to fight this fight, brothers and sisters. I'm going to fight it. Let them have the paper. For all I know, that can be God's design that you done done enough testing. You done done enough therapy. I need you for a bigger calling now. I don't know if that's what it is, but I'm just going to follow the spirit and let it take me where it got to go. All right. I got to rely on God a little bit more now and leave it where it be. So I'm going to push forward with the school. We got one in Atlanta that I'm looking at. Not as modern as I want it to be, but I get a lot of love in Atlanta. Atlanta is like Detroit to me. Atlanta, Detroit, Chicago, New York, Houston, where I just came from, those are big cities for Dr. Umar Johnson. So I'm going to just see what happens. But Detroit, I'm, I, I really wanted you guys because Atlanta has an infrastructure. They got a burgeoning black middle class. They have an infrastructure. And I don't want to do a Kevin Durant move, if you understand what I'm saying. You understand? I don't want to be the best player going to the best team. That ain't helping us. I want to go to a team that can use a power forward like Dr. Umar Johnson to slam dunk some crackers. Do you understand me? I don't want to do a Kevin Durant. If I go to Atlanta, that's like doing a Kevin Durant. I'm not against it, but I'm like, you know what? Detroit black folks is a little bit more on the ground type. Roll up your sleeves type. If it ain't nothing to eat, make some grits tight. You understand me? And so your working class nature fits in with my Garveyite character, if you can understand what I'm saying. Yes. So that's why I spend more time in Detroit than any other city in America looking for schools this year. The minister, I tell you, every time I come, minister, you got a show coming on tonight? That's right. Every time you see me on his show, it's because I'm here looking for schools, and I'm trying, y'all, but the wheels ain't turning fast enough. So if you can turn them, you need to turn them because... I believe, and I hope I'm wrong, and I don't want to speak nothing wrong into existence that I ask my ancestors to hold it back if it ain't true, but if they can shut down my GoFundMe, if they can shut down my Facebook, if they can stop my Instagram Live, if they can, the reason why these seats are empty today, because you know I sell out every time I come to Detroit. The reason I haven't sold out today is because Eventbrite, where you bought your tickets to come in, they kept freezing the Detroit sales. And then I redid it, and they froze them again. So people is like, I want to go see Dr. Umar, but it's so damn cold. I don't want to get out there and be told I can't come in. So because they kept freezing the cells, people thought we were sold out already. Right. There's people who would be here in your city who ain't here because online the cells have stopped. And normally when the cells stop, it means I sold out because I normally do when I come here. So that means I need to come back to Detroit sooner than later. I can't wait another That's year. Right. But what I'm saying, brothers and sisters, I think it's only a matter of time. But for black folks, get these white people to freeze that school account. And once they freeze that school account, ain't going to be no FDMG. So the haters have forced my hand to move faster. I don't want to move faster, but I ain't got no choice because I'm looking at what's going on around me. Everything is freezing up around me. Everything is freezing up. So I got to move quick. Chicago in the cut, I'm trying to wait and see what's going on in Detroit because the realtor I'm working with, who excuse me, works for the city, showed me a school. I don't know the name of it, so I can't tell you. But it's a pretty modern school. It ain't one of the old ones. It looked like it was a charter school. It's downtown. I think it's downtown. And it sits on the corner. He showed it to me, but we couldn't get inside when I was here last time, about three weeks ago. Right. So he's trying to get the keys to let me in. He said it's definitely for sale. They want the low 400s. I said, we got that. Get them keys. I've been pressuring him to get the damn keys for January 2nd, January 3rd. I said if I need to hang around in Detroit to January 4th, January 5th, I'll hang around. But I got to get back to Philly because I got to go before Caesar on Monday day. So when I'm done with y'all tonight, I got to call him. Did you get the damn keys? I can't keep waiting because these coons want to destroy everything I'm working for. And some of you sitting in here right with me. Keep it a ball. Most of you not, but one or two of you coons in here can't see what I'm trying to get done. 
So you feeding and retweeting, and then soon as somebody go to war, you the first one saying, y'all not acting like leaders. Right. I didn't know sitting on your laptop doing radio shows, paying white people to make white supremacy documentaries made you a leader. I'm going to get back to that kind of artist in a minute, Mr. Mac Lessons. I'm going to come back to that ass. Okay? I'm a Mac Daddy by night and a black leader by daytime, and y'all love it. And you know why you love that coon? Because he don't make you do no damn work. All you got to do is tune into a radio show. Dr. Umar Johnson going to make you work. I ain't about radio shows. I'm about real measurable progress. But everybody knows the quickest way to make a buck in America right now is to get into black consciousness. That's right, we the new mega church. You can hold tap your way to a nice paycheck if you know what to say. Shea butter Negroes, whole teppers. Change your name to Aunt Ganeb Rasaneb Ma'at Kanu. But your damn paycheck still say Randy Jackson. I wanna to talk to my parents first because we got babies in the house. First of all, remember, I got the Tuesday morning call tomorrow, okay? Now, if I ain't on the phone tomorrow, you know what that means. They didn't shut that down, too, okay? But if you got a child and you have any issues, Dr. Umar Johnson gives out free expert advice every Tuesday morning. So from my hotel here in Detroit, I'll be up, waking up early, 6 o'clock. You can call in, and I'm going to make sure you have that number to call in. In fact, take your phone out now. I'm going to give you the number now so I don't forget because, you know, once I get into my message and the spirit pop, that's it. Okay? The phone number for the Tuesday morning call, because some of y'all are dealing with issues with your children. They want to suspend them, expel them, diagnose them with autism, which is real. But you don't get babies. They got it or not. My baby, two years old, he's autistic. How the hell you know? Because he ain't talking. Maybe he got an ear infection. Maybe he got bilateral hearing damage. Maybe it's social anxiety. Maybe it's trauma. Or maybe he's just a slow bloomer. How about giving the boy some time before you throw the label on him? Learning disabilities isn't like cancer. Cancer, you want to catch cancer early so you can cut it out. You can't cut out autism. You can't cut out a reading disability. If he got autism, it ain't no cure. So whether he gets diagnosed at two or three or four, the trajectory is the same because there's no cure. So why y'all feel so much better misdiagnosing him early instead of just being patient? I know why. The early intervention center wants you to diagnose him early so they can put him in the system and start getting paid for him early. This is about money. This ain't about helping nobody. That's right. You're going to the same white man that caused your problems to solve them. What is a black parent taking black kids to white people for to fix their problems? Phone number tomorrow morning, 857 857-232-0158. 857-232-0158. When you call in, they're going to ask for an access code. The access code is 870-864-POUND. I repeat, the access code is 870-864-POUND. If you did not get that, text my cell phone and I will text you the flyer for tomorrow morning's call because I don't want no excuses. My cell number is 215. You going too fast? You got an IEP? I'm picking with you. I'm picking with you. 215-989-9858. I repeat, 215-989-9858. One more time, because I know we got some elders in the building. 215-989-9858. Ladies, it ain't that type of party. <laughs> I have been through one scandal already. I'm not looking for another. By the way, you know the FBI is reading every text I got. So unless you went Donald Trump looking at that thong, don't send it. Ashe. Ashe. 
Now, parents, I want to give y'all some rules you need to use to control the schools. Some rules you need to use to control the school. Rule number one, stop telling the school all your family business. Single mothers, I want you to listen up well. I know you're proud to be a single mother. But the public school ain't the place to let white folks know you're a single mother. Because saying you're a single mother only tells them you're doing it by yourself with no support. You don't need white folks knowing that you ain't got no backup. Why? Because the black boy of a single mother is five times as likely to be put in special ed. He's 12 times as likely to be suspended. He's four times as likely to be expelled. He's 25 times more likely to be diagnosed with a learning disability. So you don't want white folks knowing you a single mom. Single mom means no support. Keep your business private. If they ask you if you're married, say hell yeah, three times. <laughs> Tell them you got three husbands. And then bring all three of them up there so they understand you're not making it up. I'm serious. You go to the school looking for sympathy. This is what y'all do. You pull up and you ask this Miss Slurbanowski for some sympathy. <laughs> Miss Slurbanowski is your third grade son's teacher at We Hate Black People Charter School in Detroit. And you go to Miss Slurbanowski at We Hate Black People Charter School in Detroit and you say, Miss Slurbanowski, this is my third time being called up here. You want me to put my son on meds. You're threatening if I don't put him on drugs, you're going to expel my boy. My son ain't got conduct disorder or oppositional defiant disorder. He's not ADHD either. Let me tell you why my Rahim is behaving this way. His father just got locked up last month. His father was his life. I just started a new job, 90-day probation. I need to make it through these 90 days, and if I make it through the 90 days, I'll be promoted to a full-time employee. Right now, I'm working 12-hour shifts. My Raheem ain't seeing me as much. He lost his father. My daughter's father, he just got shot last year, God forbid. I'm living in my mother's house, me and my three kids, in one room in the back of my mother's house, trying to make ends meet. But I got a good job coming if I can get through these 90 days. And Ms. Lerbanowski, who recognizes that you are there for a plea for pity, plays on your need for sympathy from crackers. Because after 400 years, you still don't recognize that white folks love to kick black people when you're down. Amen. And so she says, Oh, Shaquita, I'm so sorry to hear about the bad news. I didn't know that black mothers were under such distress here in the city of Detroit. I empathize with you. I'm a divorced mother raising Robbie, Peter, and little James on my own, too. Maybe we can support one another. May I have a hug, please? Can we pray together? Because uh, you're not going to believe me when I say this. But you're my hero. So you hug that cracker. You pray to white Jesus with that cracker. And then you leave and go back to work thinking you won her over. She played your ass like a tune. The minute you left We Hate Black People Charter School in Detroit, Slurbanowski took her flat butt down to the principal's office. I'm going to tell you what she did. She took her inverted ass to the principal's office. and told Dr. Silverberg that I just met with Raheem's mother, Mrs. Shaquita. She was crying. She seemed to be hysterical. She might have been high on drugs. I don't know. Black people's eyes are naturally big, but hers were really big. She smelled like marijuana. Cigarette smoke all over her. She told me that she's living with her three kids in her mother's back room. That can't be healthy. Maybe that explains why Rob Raheem comes to class with dirty socks. He's been wearing the same dirty socks for a week, Dr. Silverberger. I don't want to tell on Shaquita, but I'm a mandated reporter. Two weeks later, Detroit Protective Services is knocking on your front door, doing a so-called anonymous investigation. But it's not anonymous because you know exactly who told on you. And now you're at risk of getting your children taken from the home 
because you told your business to white folks. You better learn to keep your mouth shut. Rule number one, the school don't get my business. And then there's a rule number 1A. And guess what rule number 1A is? Make sure your children understand that the school don't get your business. See, some of y'all getting in trouble because you're not teaching our children about white supremacy. Some of you getting in trouble with white folks because you're not teaching your children about white supremacy. They don't belong to this family. And when you really become conscious, you won't feel guilty about telling your children that they are the enemy. I knew that I don't tell my father's business when I went to school. And your children need to know as well because those school counselors are very, very strategic. The school nurse is very, very clever. The school social worker knows how to squeeze your, your personal business. They give them taffies and pat them on the back and say, it's okay, we're here to help. Have you ever seen cocaine on the kitchen table? <laughs> I'm serious, brothers and sisters. I work in schools. Been in them for 20 years as a principal and a school psychologist. I know how they play you. And one thing you don't understand is the minute you walk out that school, they talk about you behind your back like you a dog. They will smile and... You don't know how many times I almost vomited to watch white women smile in a black mother's face. The school is an extension of the prison system. The principal is the new warden, and Miss Lerbanowski is the new police officer. And anything you say can and will be used against you. After all, isn't it amazing that in the Detroit suburbs you got White people, $250,000 a year families, white wife, white husband. The wife makes a living miseducating your son. And the husband makes a living locking him up once the wife is done. Isn't it amazing how many white teachers are married to police? The same men harassing our sons on the street, his wife is miseducating your child. And I got Negroes whining about $700,000 when you spent $2 billion last year on Air Jordans. I got Negroes crying over $700,000 when black women spent $9 billion last year on weave and perm. I got Negroes crying over $700,000 when you spent the same amount on McDonald's last year, crying over 700 grand when you spent 4 billion on liquor and alcohol. <laughs> Brothers and sisters, do you know how hard it is to buy a school when you only have $700,000? Better yet, let me give you another fact that I don't want to leave. There's a school that I want sitting in Southfield, Michigan right now. It's the best school on my list. It's better than the school in Chicago. It's better than the school in Atlanta. It's better than the school I'm about to go see in South Carolina. My number one choice is in Southfield, Michigan. It's the Academy of Southfield. Some of y'all know it. It's owned by two black men. It used to be a charter school. And the only reason why I don't got it, because they won't work with me, because I only got 700000 and they want $1.1 million. Go tell the haters that shit. The school I want is in your town, well, right across the street in Southfield. But they won't work with me because they're thirsty for cash. And they're telling me, if you give me the whole 700 grand, we'll give you a note and you can pay off the other, what is that, 700 grand minus 1.5 is another 450 grand? I can't do that. You want to know why I can't do that? Because if it took y'all three and a half years to give me 700 grand, how I know if I give them every penny y'all gave me that y'all gonna make sure I make that note every month. You will turn your back on me and go watch some Nashi videos. I can't stop thinking about that school. That school is clean. It don't need no work. They got a fireplace in it. They got modulars outside and the modulars can fit like another 300 students. If I was able to get the Academy of Southfield brothers and sisters, I could do K-12, to but we short on the money, and y'all crying about the money I ain't spent. Come on. Come on. And if you don't believe me, drive past the school when you leave here today. That's my number one choice, but I ain't got enough. Because y'all Negroes run around poking fun at me. 
with coons who ain't never tried to do nothing for you but take your money and pay his mortgage in the suburbs. You right, brother, and sleeping with white women while he telling you about white supremacy. No, I'm not talking about his wife. I won't speak on nobody's wife. I'm talking about his love for white females. White neighborhood, love white girls, give the hidden colors money to white producers to make a white supremacy documentary. I'm going to say it again. Live in a white suburb and gives your hidden colors money to white people to produce a white supremacy documentary. All of the hidden colors were produced by white folks. I know because they were there when I got interviewed. I'm sure there's black men in Detroit who know how to make films. I'm right. sure there's black women who know how to make films. I know we do, because everywhere I go, I see young people saying, Doc, I'm into films. When are you ready to shoot that shock documentary? Yeah. But your good brother Tyreek Nashi can't find a single black person to help him do Hidden Colors. But you don't care. You love him because he don't make you do no work. Let me get back to my rules for the schools. So rule number one, keep your business to yourself. Rule number two, never go to a meeting by yourself. Never go to a school meeting by yourself. Mothers, bring a man with you. Yes. Always take some masculine energy. I know some of y'all strong and shit. Y'all love it. I'm strong. <laughs> I'm strong. <coughs> the white woman that made some of y'all think you got to act like a man to be equal to one. I said, the white woman got y'all thinking, you got to act like a man. You got to imitate our masculinity in order to feel equal. That is not African. In our culture, your strength is your femininity, not imitating my masculinity. In fact, black women, you got to take your femininity back. Because the white woman that brainwashed black women into thinking that being feminine is to be weak. But well, she's still feminine. The Chinese woman is still feminine. The Arab is still feminine. The Mexican is still feminine. The Latino is still feminine. But the black woman got to act like a damn brute man in order to say she's strong. That's right. And then y'all brutalize each other with this masculinity issue. That's right. If a black woman tells another black woman, I'm tired of being single, I need a man, shut up and be strong. <laughs> A black woman tell another black woman, I'm hurting, I got issues, I'm depressed, stop being weak, damn it, we ain't made that way. You ain't allowed to be vulnerable, not even to your own sisters. If you say I need a man to help me raise these boys, cut it out, we don't need no damn man for nothing, we the mother and the father. I see black women giving each other Father's Day cards, what the hell is that? <laughs> I tell you what, you shave that weave off and we see all them scabs on that scalp, you can get a Father's Day call. <laughs> see, when I get married, black woman, I don't want to see your resume. I don't want to see your credit score. I don't care how many children you got. The only thing I want to know before I get married is what is the condition of your scalp? <laughs> I'm doing scalp checks, damn that. Black man, you best do a scalp check. And I know this because I was a barber in high school. They taught me how to cut hair. I've been cutting my own hair since I was 15 years old. And I'm going to teach your sons how to do it at FDMG. And so because I know how to cut hair, I know what be under that damn weave. Some of y'all got a Grand Canyon on that damn scalp. Look like you were sparring with Rocky and Apollo Creed. That's right, edges all out, look like you're going bald up the middle, George Jefferson and shit, what's going on? So black man, you got to scalp check your queen. Put some shea butter on that damn thing, some two-tonk almond shea butter. Some strawberry almond butter. Some hot ginger tea oil or something. Get the damn roots up. Oh! A lot of black women forced to go natural, sisters. I'm telling y'all the truth. My young sisters, you under 30, and you still got your scalp that can be salvaged, quit while you ahead. Because once you get 40 and 50, it ain't growing back. 
you will end up with a half row. Not true. Young sisters, you don't need that. Go natural. And brothers, we can't pelt fun at the sisters for not being natural because the only reason why black women are not natural is because brothers don't want natural sisters. That's right. We talk black power, but we don't want to live it. That's right. Brother be black power, RBG, and then soon the sister come home with a nappy head. We didn't talk about this. So brothers, we can, do you know what would happen in America if every black woman went natural at the same time? Do you know what that would do to the self-esteem of black girls? I'm not asking you to go natural for yourself. Okay? I'm telling you, go natural for your daughter and your son. Because some of y'all complain about your son coming home with white girls. Well, if mama trying to look like one, what's wrong with getting a real one? See, I'm just giving you the facts. And some of y'all don't like me because I'm brutally honest. In fact, the reason I got all this crap going on is because you said, I can't believe that a Negro who talked that wrong can actually have six degrees from three major white universities. That's your problem here. Those other coons ain't got them credentials. I do. And you say, there's no way with the stuff he said that he got them credentials. So then the question becomes, if I ain't got no credentials, then how is the State Board of Psychology calling me up to take them away? And the big question is, what does it matter in the first place? That's right. If we are about black consciousness, since when does white credentials matter? Right. Half the people on YouTube ain't got a credential the first. <laughs> I know people call themselves doctors in the conscious community ain't got no damn doctorate. But you have never heard me speak ill of them because if you consider somebody a doctor, that's your right. It don't make me shrink. I know I earned mine, they didn't, but it don't bother me because I'm not in competition with another man. I'm in competition with the white man for my liberation. <laughs> but I'll be honest with you, I want 10 rounds with Nasheed inside of the damn ring. <laughs> Punk ass. I ain't playing. If Sarnetic can make it happen, I'm going to do it. Get your punk ass in here and bring your lip gloss with you and your makeup. <laughs> Metrosexual, and let's get it on. <laughs> the next rule. Mothers, are y'all listening? This is really for the mothers. Fathers too, but this is really for the mothers. Never, ever again, as long as you live, as long as you have children, in public school, charter school, parochial school, Catholic school, independent school, never, ever, 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 Drop your kids off for school in your damn pajamas. What the hell is wrong with y'all? It's become a fad. Why are black mothers dropping off kids with pajamas on? Do you know what you're telling white folks when you do that? The message is you don't work. You have absolutely nothing to do. And the minute you drop them off, you're going to go home Strip and twerk for your boo. Morning session. Post omelet morning session. Dirty waffle. Shut it out, Bob. Ladies, listen. They talk about y'all. And I don't care what they say about you. Let's be clear. We don't care what white folks think about you. There's nothing new they're going to say about us after 400 years. Y'all know that? After 400 years, white folks can't think of nothing new to say about black folks. They didn't said it already. So I don't care what they think, okay? But what I do care about is their assumption about you affecting how they treat your child. You showing up in pajamas? Oh, we can call her to come pick him up anytime. She ain't got no life. You showing up in pajamas? Oh, we can suspend him all day. His mother ain't got no job to go to. And guess what? You might work second shift. You might work third shift. Some of y'all work at 12 hours, you go into work at 2, so you can show up in your pajamas, run home, get a few more hours of sleep, and then go to work. But white folks ain't going to come to that conclusion. They're going to say you're a ghetto mom with nothing to do. And when y'all do show up with y'all pajamas, you know what's so interesting? 
Y'all always have your makeup and your eyelashes done. <laughs> There's some damn SpongeBob flip flops on the <laughs> You don't drop children off in pajamas. Next rule if your child is in the third grade or younger. If your child is in the third grade or younger, never, ever, ever let them get evaluated for learning disabilities. Y'all better listen to me. Because some of y'all got children in first grade with an IEP. Be ashamed of yourself. Second grade with an IEP. Be ashamed of yourself. Kindergarten, preschool with an IEP. Can I ask you a question? How can a first grader have a reading disability if he just started learning how to read? You know what? When y'all walk into the school, when y'all walk into the school, your brain shuts down. And you go into your slave consciousness. And you start doing whatever white folks told you to do. Because whenever I ask a black mother or father, why did you do that? I don't know. Let me tell you why. Because your slave master told you to. That's why. Some of us are uncomfortable disagreeing with white people. Can we be honest tonight? Let's be honest. Some of us are uncomfortable. You ain't uncomfortable disagreeing with white folks? Bring your ass to Hasburg, Pennsylvania on Monday to that state board. Because I might get locked the hell up that day. I'm turning tables over like Jesus that day. In fact, I'm going to go in there with a robe and sandals on. And they're going to say, stand and state your name. I am the Messiah. Let them crackers try to play. Now I'm going to curse them out. The hearing office is some nasty white lady anyway. I'm going to say, you flat-ass woman. <laughs> Who the hell are you to question my credentials, you cracker? <laughs> I say, I rebuke all you devils in the name of God. <laughs> Barbara, you going to have to come because they going to get me. <laughs> in fact, I don't even know if I'm going to bring my lawyer. Because if I bring my lawyer, I ain't going to be able to talk. The lawyer talk. I'm thinking about going up in there, buck solo. Because what they're doing to me is wrong, y'all. Yeah. It's wrong. I ain't bothering no white folks. I don't date your women. I don't want to live in your neighborhood. I don't pay your people to make my DVDs. I'm messing with their money. When they take my paperwork, I'm going to really mess with their money. Let them take that damn paperwork if they want. They be on my live feed. The crackers be on my live feed. Investigating, calling me, quoting what I said. Why are you watching me Tuesday morning when you're a homosexual? <laughs> <laughs> Did you, mom? And they better not ask me a gay question, because I might have to keep it real. <laughs> I'ma say, y'all gave us that shit in slavery. <laughs> Uh, you know what? Y'all weren't about the school. Y'all better start us a free Umar fund. <laughs> Come get me from Harrisburg Jail. I'm going to go in on them damn devils. Curse Trump and Obama and everybody else. Shoot. <laughs> Who you think you are in my courtroom? I am God, you damn devil. Listen to me, mothers and fathers. You cannot prove a learning disability. There's no blood test, no urine sample, no x-ray, no CAT scan, no MRI. In fact, Detroit, if I'm the first to tell you, because this might be the last time you've seen me in public as a certified school psychologist. No, we hoping it ain't the case, and we're not being dreadful or gloomy, but I want y'all to be honest. This may very well be, so you better get a picture with my ass tonight. <laughs> so you can say, I was with him on the last day. <laughs> and I got to make jest of it because it's hurtful. So you got to laugh to take, keep your strength. That's right. Because my own people took me to them damn devils. That's right. 
So let me tell y'all what we do when we test your kids for special ed, because I don't want none of y'all to act like y'all don't know after today, because some of y'all like lying because you're scared of white folks. I bring your son into my room. First of all, I don't even like that. I don't like little black girls in a room all by themselves with white men. I don't like the mother and father. I interview the teachers. I observe him in the classroom. I review his academic and behavioral record. I look at any outside evaluations that he had. And then based on all of this, I do some hoodoo, voodoo, shoo kudu. I'm telling you how they do this. And then they say, based off of what I see, because I don't know. Are y'all following me? Based off what I see, I think he got a reading disability. I think she got a math disability. I think your grandson got ADHD. I think your daughter got conduct disorder. I think your three-year-old is autistic. Do I know for sure? Hell no. Because the only thing the test gives us is numbers. Let me say it again. The test gives us numbers. Let me say it one more time. The test gives us numbers. No test gives a diagnosis. No test gives a diagnosis. And I'm the first psychologist to tell your ass that. And do you want to know why? Because the rest of them want you to think they're 100% accurate because if you believe in the accuracy of the test, you won't have a problem with the misdiagnosis. Right. Right. Mm. Mm. My facts are undisputed. That's, right. That's why none of them crackers ever challenged me to a public debate. I eat their ass up. In fact, I might get God is not she to the baby since he don't want to fight. Let's uh, debate. Uh, <laughs> and old fat voice Watkins ass keep making videos about it. <laughs> you swagless bitch! Ain't got an ounce of swag in his ass. No gangster. Well, he said another thing about me last night. I just want to go into this for five minutes. I just want to, I just want to, then I'm going to move on. Have you signed up for my economic stimulus boot camp? We're doing the boot camp. I'll probably be in your sound now. Join voicewalkins.com. <laughs> Punk ass. Have you ever seen a Negro produce 20 videos a day? Do you work for them? Umar this, Umar that, Umar this, Umar that. Oh, why does he call himself the prince? He refers to himself as the third person. Who's this guy? Frederick Douglass. <laughs> Go shave your nose hairs, you swagless maggot! So, brothers and sisters, we now know that the learning disability is only a what? Opinion. It's only a what? Hypothesis. It's only a what? Working formulation. So any mother in here who says, my son got a reading disability, you're not stating a fact. You're stating an assumption you made based off a white person's estimation of your child's ability to learn. Shame on you. Isn't it amazing? Our ancestors learned how to read during slavery under threat of death, whippings, castration, and beatings. Frederick Douglass taught himself how to read. He was escaped from slavery to freedom in 1838. And you mean to tell me he can learn how to read under threat of death in 1838? Your son is in 2017, mm -hmm. and he can't, 2018, mm -hmm. and he can't learn how to read without a white teacher helping him out. And then let's go a step further. I got another question for y'all special ed loving black parents in Michigan. Can you please tell me, because I'm a school psychologist for six more days, can you please tell me? <laughs> I'm going to show my ass on Monday. If I get the, the first 10 minutes, I'm going to fill these crackers out. And I'm going to see if they're here to give me a warning, if they're here to scare me, or if they're here to strip me. And if I get the feeling that they're there to take my paper, attorney, leave now, because I do not want you to be held accountable for what I'm about to do. And I'm going to go off. I'm a great dancer. I'm <laughs> but anyway, brothers and sisters, my question is, what is so special about special education? Y'all been putting y'all kids in special ed for years. Can somebody tell me what's so special about it? Do you know what they do with special ed? Because some of y'all think it helps your child. They take a kid who's reading less than grade level because special ed is 85% reading. Special ed is 85% reading. We got a few deaf kids and a few blind kids and a few autistic kids and a few ADHD kids and a few traumatic brain injury, but special ed is 85% reading. 
reading. If we would only make our kids practice reading more, exactly. there would be no special ed. And if there's no special ed, there's no mass incarceration either. Yeah. Two million black kids in special ed, two million black men in prison, you do the calculations. But anyway, Ms. Furbanowski gets your child and brings her to her learning support class. Oh, that's so cute. And she take your son and put him in a class with a other bunch of boys who've been miseducated. And she's supposed to get them up to grade level by giving out handouts, mm -hmm. photocopies, mm -hmm. watching Sesame Street. Right. Here's the question. How does a child ever catch up going slower than everybody else? So guess what? Your son is in the third grade reading on a kindergarten level. Five years later, He's in the eighth grade, reading on the third grade level. Do you see what just happened? Yeah. The gap between him and other children his age just got wider. By the time he gets to 11th grade, he's reading on the fifth grade level. It got wider again. And by the time he graduates, you will actually think he had a learning disability because the school actually manufactured it. Exactly. Special ed is a business. Special ed is a racket. Special ed is a hustle of making money off kids you know you never taught before. You know what the real diagnosis is? It ain't SLD, it's ABD. He ain't never been the hell taught in the first place. Right. What do you mean, Dr. Johnson? I'll tell you what I mean. When I was in fourth grade in North Philadelphia at Meade Elementary School, my teacher, Miss Mack, she told us how to read using a phonics-based program. How many of y'all remember that phonics-based program? If you're 40 and older, you remember phonics. Some of you 35ers might have had it as well. Scalp damage, you had it too. You just had to sit in the back. Listen, when we showed up for fourth grade, y'all remember this. Miss Mack will put a big A on the board. And the whole day, repeat after me, she would say, eh, oh, ah. Y'all remember that, don't you? All damn day. Yeah. Throat was dry as hell. You needed a little septic, some honey lemon, some ginger. Ah, ah. Uh. Next day came in, she put a big B. Ba, ba, ba. Next day to C, ka, ka, ka. And then when y'all did all the alphabet, she put the A and the B together. Ab, ab, ab. The A and the C together. Ak, ak. Ah, the A and the D together. Da, da, da. <laughs> Do y'all remember that? And once and she works. got done teaching you how to read using phonics, they could put any word in front of you. It could be 50 letters long, and you could read it. They don't do that no more, because lazy, nasty white women with no backs in Detroit don't got time to put that kind of energy into the reading, so they came up with something new called whole language. And you know what they do with whole language? They teach your kids how to read using a sight-based vocabulary word list. So every week, your son comes home, Mommy, these are my 10 words. I got to learn them by heart. Not learn how to read them. Memorize the word. This is what they do. Oh, these crackers are slick. <laughs> Talking about they underpaid. I think y'all overpaid. <laughs> and then when you put some words in front of your son he never saw before, <clears throat> for the first time you realize, my baby can't read. Because y'all only teach him how to identify, not decode. But at the Frederick Douglass Marcus Garvey Academy, we're going to be phonics, baby. That's right. Sit your ass down. <laughs> Stage. But a part of me was glad I couldn't get on because I wasn't supposed to bring the new year like that. 
And not only that, I'm just laying in my bed when that clock struck 12.00. And all I can say is, next year, yeah. that school got to be up. So I'm rushing to get to school in the first quarter, brothers and sisters, because I'm ready to get started. And if you want to work at FDMG, send me your resume. You cannot be a hater. <laughs> okay? If you support God is not sheeta, don't even apply. I don't want nobody who love that type of energy, okay? You cannot be sexually confused. <laughs> cannot be dating, married to, making babies with, or cohabiting with alien species. <laughs> if your ass like aliens, go get in the spaceship, okay? You can't be a role model if that's who you bring in front of our children. That's a contradictory message. I am a pan-Africanist, okay? You can get away with that shit with Melanoid Nation. You ain't going to get away with that team Pan-African. Okay? But if you want to work at the school, send your resume. F-D-M-G resumes. F-D-M-G resumes with an S on the end at gmail.com. I need teachers, but I also need security guards. I need teachers, but I also need people who know agriculture because our children have to learn how to grow. The one thing I do like about the Aisha Shule building, although it's going to cost me almost a million dollars to rehab it, is they got some land in the back that we can use for our school farm. Okay? I also need sisters. I also need sisters who know how to do natural hair because all the girls got to be natural when we open up the girls' academy. We start with the boys, but we extend it to the princesses. That's right. What good is having a whole bunch of revolutionary young men when you got a whole bunch of coon queens? That ain't going to work. So we got to wake the daughters up too. That's right. Straight up. All right? I need people who have unique talents. I got a brother who knows how to make shoes. He's going to teach our kids how to make shoes. That's right. I know a brother who knows how to dry clean clothing. He's going to teach our kids how to dry clean clothing. When your child graduates from FDMG, I need him to have 21 different ways to get paid without going to jail that don't require a college degree. That's all I'm trying to do. Sometimes I wish I didn't start the fundraiser. I don't think I'll be going to Harrisburg on uh, Monday. But I got to because I got to stay true to myself. We need institutions. I know y'all not ready to work a lot of you. You just want to sit on social network and act black. Go to the damn, uh, the, the, uh, what's the museum? The Charles? Charles A. Wright. Charles A. Wright Summerfest. Beautiful festival, but that's when you want to be black when you're having fun. Well, I got something to tell you, brothers and sisters. You're going to have fun being black, but you also going to have some miserable days as well. Because we got struggles ahead of us. White men trying to wipe us out. Detroit, they trying to get rid of you and make the Arab the new minority. Oh, yeah. Chicago, they trying to get rid of blacks and make the Latinos the new minority. Everywhere you go, they moving blacks out and bringing other people in to replace you. And do you know why? You're the only non-white people in America who cannot be deported. Slavery destroyed your ancestral lineage to your homeland. That's how you became melanoid, because you don't want to be African. That's right. And since the white man stole your African identity, he can't send you back because you identify more with him than where you come from. You can send Chinese back. They know they're Chinese. You can send Arabs back. They know they're Arabs. You can send uh, 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 East Indians back. They know, but you don't know who you are. The white man stuck with you, and then he got to to be mad at you for something he created. What do you do with 50 million people you do not want and cannot stand? You have to systematically depopulate them with a specific program of homosexuality, AIDS, birth control, bad food, and poor health care. That's right. That's right. Why supremacy can only destroy you to the extent that you are dependent upon its institutions for your services and survival. You ain't got no hospitals, so you rely on the white folks in Detroit to save you when you get sick. You ain't got no supermarkets. You rely on Arabs and Chinese to feed you when you're hungry. You ain't got no banks. You got to get loans from crackers. And they never give you the loan you need. Say it again. <laughs> Say it again.
say it again. Oh, you're going to see something when you see my squad. I promise you. You coming to tour in that thing. Trust me. If a white person don't ever come visit Donald Trump, come on, President Trump is here. How do we greet the president? Cracker! <laughs> I'm going to do that. <laughs> but yes, brothers and sisters, there's four institutions you need for any serious community. Supermarket, bank, hospital, and school. You don't have those four anywhere in America. And you are a $2 trillion people, and you don't have an independent community yet. That's sad, Detroit. Especially for y'all, because y'all are 88% black concentration. You're the only major city in America with an 88% black concentration. There's more blacks in New York than Detroit, but they not 88% of the city. There's more blacks in Chicago than Detroit, but they not 88% of the city. There's more blacks in Houston and LA than Detroit, but they not 88% of the city. And you know why you ain't been able to move fast enough? Because you have a coon Illuminati whose job is to keep white power in control of the institutions and the assets. I'm not talking politicians. I'm talking masters of business. Mm. Mm. That's right. Who's the biggest real estate holder in Detroit? We need to know that. Who owns the banks in Detroit? We need to know that. Brothers and sisters, we have to become political scientists, not just whole teppers who know everything about dead people. I need you to learn about the living. That's right. That's right. Brother, come up to me, say, Doc, do you know 5,000 years ago we was in space and we came down, built the pyramids, went back? <laughs> I said, listen here, you damn alien. <laughs> Even if that's true, what does that have to do with the here and now? See, this is why the whole tempers don't like me. They want to take you back to Kemet. That was beautiful. I love visiting Kemet. But how is that solving my problems now? The church don't like me. They don't want to go back. They want to go forward to life after you die. Hell, you got to pay to go to heaven for. Ain't no entry fee. The ground don't ask you to pay for your body to go up in there. It don't cost money to save souls. Why the black church making so much money off of services that should be free? Right. And for my Christians, I ain't got no problem with your beliefs. I'm a descendant of preachers. Most of my Pan-African forefathers were ministers. I ain't got no problem with your book. I got a problem with your outlook. Right. Anybody who teaches you that your religion is more important than your people is the enemy of your people. Negro pulled me over in Chicago. He said, Doc, you be talking about the Muslims and the Christians and what is your religion? I'll tell you, brother, black power is my religion. Black liberation is my creed. Black freedom is my ethos. That's my religion. I ain't got time to be choosing labels that don't free black folks. Yes. As Dr. John Henry Clark, whose birthday we celebrate today. He was born this day in 1915, the last of the great revolutionary Pan-African nationalists, except for Dr. Ben, who was the actual last, last, of all the ites. Dr. Clark said, turn your religion into an instrument of liberation or throw it into the ash can of history. If Islam ain't freeing me, I don't want nothing to do with it. If Christianity ain't freeing me, I don't want nothing to do with it. Problem with churches, it doesn't change circumstances. It just changed your opinion of your circumstances. I'm not going to get black people out the ghetto of Detroit, but I'll make them look at the ghetto as a blessing. I'm not going to get black people in Detroit no better food, but I'm going to make them look at the poor food they're eating as a blessing. Because after all, some people don't get nothing to eat at all. So you say, I'm blessed. The job of church is to make people who broke think they got it all. The purpose of church is to keep revolutionary black men out of the freedom struggle. Because once you get drafted by a church, your feminization energy kicks in. 
And now you passive on everything. Let's just pray about it. The hell you know got free praying. That's what's wrong with black folks. You want to march your way out of struggle? You want to pray your way out of struggle? You want to vote your way out of struggle? You want to do everything except pay and build your way out of struggle. You know what your Achilles heel is? You ain't ready to sacrifice your disposable income for the best interests of all of Detroit. The Negro is the only minority in America who cannot subvert his individual selfish agenda for the best interests of us all. They over there talking about slavery in Libya. Now all of a sudden, it's a big talk about slavery in Libya. Well, brothers and sisters, I done been to every coast in Africa, and I can tell you they trading slaves all up and down the eastern side of Africa. Right. Arabia Peninsula ain't never stopped trading no damn slaves. Why are they focusing on Libya? Because last time I checked this slavery in Saudi Arabia, Last time I checked this slavery in Jordan. Last time I checked this slavery in Kuwait. Last time I checked this slavery in a whole bunch of them Arab states. But America only mentions Libya. Do you know why? They're not going to talk about Saudi Arabia because Saudi Arabia is an ally state. They're not going to talk about Kuwait because Kuwait got Africans in slavery, but it's an allied state. But we're going to talk about slavery in Libya because Libya is not friendly to us and we have an agenda. We have to go in and make it safe for democracy. Next time a cracker come to me talking about he got to go somewhere to make it safe for democracy, I'm going to say I got to come into your community and make it safe for heterosexuality. <laughs> slavery all over. You got to bust up the whole ring. And then the African Union talking about we're going to have an emergency session on slavery. Y'all know the slavery. The African presidents know. And do you know why so many of our brothers and sisters end up in slavery? Trying to cross over the desert of North Africa to get into Europe for a better life. When I go to Europe, I hear stories from brothers who made their own boat out of a tree and risked their life on the big sea, swimming with their arms, no paddle, just to get to Italy or Portugal, Austria or Spain to try to become a refugee. A re being a refugee in a white country is better than being in some African countries. Because the African leaders are just like black American leaders, a lot of them ain't number of pimps. You know what an African leader does when he gets elected? He prepares for his rich life after he's out of office. That's right. Only people benefit from an African being elected in Africa is his family. And that ain't true for all leaders. We do have some exceptions. But the black men in America ain't no different than the black men in America. All of us scared of white folks, and all of us care more about ourselves than our communities. That's right. A black man, our biggest issue is the ego. In fact, you can't have a Negro without a big ass ego. Because the ego is what makes the Negro. And if you take the E-G-O out of Negro, there couldn't be one. And you know why black men got such big egos? Because the white man never allowed us to be men. That's right, black man. We can't be men on the job. We can't be men in front of the police. Can't be men in court. Anytime you show your masculinity, you're considered a threat. So you're forced to bend down, and that breeds anger. That breeds frustration. That breeds aggression. And one day you just can't take it no more. And the next thing you know, you're taking the life of another black man suffering from the same castrated ego as yourself. Mm. Why do black men kill black men? Because it's the only men you're allowed to kill and get away with it. Mm. You ain't never had nobody teach to you this generation like I do. But that's why I need FDMG, because you need a whole bunch of Umar Johnsons around here. Yes, we do. Yes, sir. Yes, we do. Minus the drama. <laughs> Minus the drama. Zimbabwe. The reason Robert Mugabe had to go is because he stopped dancing to the tune of the United States of America. And one thing we know about Africa, if you don't do what the white man tell you to do, he will pay your enemies to throw you out of office. And that's exactly what they did. Yeah. Ain't no damn democracy in Africa. The only time an African country is allowed to practice democracy is if the person who won the election actually agrees with America's agenda. If you don't agree with America's agenda, your ass won't have no democracy. They will coup you overnight. You heard of Amakal Cabral. Yeah. Right. You heard of Kwame Nkrumah. 
You heard of Patrice Lumumba. They don't believe in no damn democracy. They believe in totalitarianism. Only time you're allowed to stay in office is if you do what the white man tell you to do. And the only solution is for all of Africa to unite. Not behind no African Union, but a real United States of Africa. That's what the continent needs. That's right. But the continent can't get free without your help, black man and woman. We are the leaders of our race, whether we like it or not. And you better accept it sooner rather than later. Because the whole African world will go to hell until Detroit... New York, Chicago, Houston, Philadelphia, and L.A. decide to take the lead in this. They looking at you. When I go to Japan next week, they gonna be, if I make it, if I don't get arrested, they're going to be looking at me to give some direction. When I get to China the week after next in Beijing, they're going to be looking at me to give them some direction. You have a responsibility, not just the black America, but the entire African family, brothers and sisters. Some of y'all don't understand racism, so I got to give you a quick lesson in it. And yes, I will teach this to your children at my school. If you have a problem with your son being unapologetically African, I suggest you send him elsewhere. The first rule of racism is that all white people are racist. Let me say it again. The first rule of racism is that all white people are racist. And my elders know this very well. And my elders also know that if they would have knew this as, as a youth, they probably would have sidestepped half the hell they didn't caught with crackers throughout their life. So we got to make sure our children understand at six that all white people are racist. That's right. And the reason you don't understand this is because you keep on confusing racism with hate. You don't have to hate black people to practice racism against black people. Racism ain't got nothing to do with hating you. White people will love you, marry you, make love to you, and still practice racism against you. Because racism ain't got nothing to do with sensual pleasure, personal ambition. Racism is about keeping power and privilege in the hands of white folks. No, I don't mind if you take all your phone, you paid to be here. You can go live if you want to. Tell God it's not she I'm looking for that ass. The rub but you can't hide, you shiny lip ass. All white people are racist, brothers and sisters. That's right. But you're not supposed to let them know you know that. You ain't you're supposed to laugh at them how they laugh at you. Because white people are masters of the imitation effect. They know how to be what you need them to be. They are Machiavellian. And you have to be the same way with them. <laughs> and play as crack ass. <laughs> Rule number two, white people don't share power with black folks. Right now they're talking about building a new Detroit downtown. They put the new Piston Stadium down there. They got new restaurants. What else they got downtown in Detroit now? Everything. They building all kinds of stuff, telling you we're going to live together in a better city. You are an absolute coon if you think that Piston Stadium got put downtown for you. That is for the white folks who are coming back to retake Detroit. The hell wrong with you? This is a major city with railroads and waterways. You think they're going to lead at the black folks? No! They're coming and take it back. And if you own any of it, you better hold on to it. And if you don't own any of it, you better buy a piece of it. You can decide what to do with it later. That's what's wrong with black folks. There's a piece of land over there. It's real cheap, but I don't know what I'm going to do with it, so I'm going to pass. How about put it in your great-grandchild's great-grandchild's name? So 50 years from now, when a piece of land in Detroit is about a million dollars an acre, it'll still be in your family. Stop living for your selfish ass self and start planning for your grandchildren's grandchildren. White folks don't share power with no black folks. Anybody ever heard of the Maafa 21 DVD? Did y'all know that that was produced by a white man? Maafa 21 is produced by a white man. They should start selling it with hidden colors. Say that again? Yeah. They called me up, Bobby. The black, the white man's black man called me up wow. and said, we want to feature you in your very own documentary. We're going to call it post-traumatic slavery disorder. It's going to be you. I said, damn, that sounds kind of strong. I said, you own that? He said, no, it's owned by, I don't know, Peter Schwarzenberg or some shit. I said, what? I said, are you telling me my Alpha 21, which is one of the most popular conscious DVDs, right. is produced by a white man? He said, yes, Bob. Mm. You got white folks out here making conscious DVDs. Yeah. Yeah. 
God is not she that ain't the only one doing it. You got other folks doing it. So you got to be careful with the consciousness now. Yes. And what's rule number three of white supremacy? Rule number three of white supremacy is white supremacy, brothers and sisters, is absolutely ruthless. Did y'all hear what I just said? If I got to kill your kids, if I got to poison the immunization so every black boy in Detroit get autism, if I got to create AIDS to get rid of black women, if I got to push homosexuality in the public schools, if I got to go to Africa and destroy the soil, whatever I got to do to control this planet, I will do it. And let me explain why you don't understand white folks, because you don't understand their psycho-biological climatology. <laughs> let me give you a quick story about the psycho biological climatology of white folks. And then we're gonna start wrapping up so I can sign books and take pictures. And what I want y'all to do, if I could have someone let the queens outside know, since these people came out to see Dr. Umar in the cold, everything for sale on my table is $10. The hoodies are 10, the books are 10, the flags are 10. Only for you, you better not tell a soul <laughs> that I gave your ass a $10 sale. Because I don't ever sell my book for $10. But because y'all sacrificed for me, I'm a sacrifice for y'all. Today is a $10 sale. Right. So listen to me, brothers and sisters. <laughs> when God created the universe, God put sun people on earth first. Sun people lived under the sun. The sun provided them with ample drinking water. The sun provided them with vegetation, with fruit, with vegetables, with fish. The sun provided them with animals for meat and for clothing. And the sun provided them with wood for houses and for shipbuilding to go fishing. And because the sun gave them everything. They didn't have to steal from each other. Because the sun gave them everything. Nobody had to lock their door because nobody went into another man's house, Bob. That's right. Because the sun gave them everything. There was no such thing as a homeless shelter or a food bank because there was enough to go around. The sun people lived in a perpetual heaven on earth. And because the sun was so great, they used the sun to symbolize God. They didn't pray to the sun. That's right. The sun was the symbol of supreme consciousness because just as nothing can survive without the sun, nothing can survive without God. That's right. So when you say you are the sun people, it's just like saying you're God's people. But then God created the ice people. They lived in the ice, in the caves. A cold 50 times colder than what you have in Detroit today. These ice people didn't have no fruit. These ice people didn't have no vegetation. These ice people didn't have clean drinking water because there was no running water, no fresh water. They didn't have animals. There was no beef ribs, no chicken wings. It was too cold for any animal to survive in the ice age. So guess what they had to do? They had to eat ants, roaches, maggots, they had to eat the skin of their dead. And because there wasn't anything to drink, they had to suck the blood of the dead as well. They used to kill each other, fight each other. Because it wasn't enough to go around, the ice people had to connive. They had to manipulate. They had to undermine, underhand. They had to be strategic. And whenever they found something, they never shared it. They kept it all to themselves. Do you want to know why? because they didn't live under abundance like the sun people. So there was never enough to go around. So if the ice man found some food, he didn't tell the other ice people, he kept it all to himself because he knew it would run out and he didn't believe nature would give him anything to replace it. Mm. The reason you don't un understand white folks is because you come from a totally different psychobiological climatology. You come from abundance, he comes from scarcity. The reason Africans can live in harmony with nature you don't try to mess with the crops. You don't try to mess with the animals. You don't try to change the seasons. You don't try to create diseases. You don't try to replicate God. You don't try to control planets and galaxies. But the white man does. He fears nature. 
because nature never blessed him. Nature treated the white man like a stepchild that he could not stand. And because nature could not love the white man, the white man cannot love nature. He's at war with nature. And because you are nature's first child, he's automatically at war with you. This is why the white man don't know how to act. Wherever he go, he messes some shit up. Everywhere he went, he caused chaos. And you know what's so interesting? The white man has never done a systematic study, Baba, on his own psychopathology. He loved to talk about black men killing black men. He loved to talk about black people being broke. He loved to talk about single black mothers. He loved to talk about black men going to jail. Why has the white man never done a study on his own sickness? White men study everybody but the white man. So we need to start giving him studies. Like he always coming on TV talking about something. We've done studies on the inner city of Detroit and we found out that only four out of every five black men actually wants to work anyway. How the hell you do a study like that? <laughs> so we got to start doing stuff. We've done some research and we found out that you are actually only 85% human being. You're 8% devil and 9% Neanderthal. <laughs> we've done studies. And black woman, I know the black man that lost his mind dating these nasty white girls in Detroit, but don't you catch that jungle feet. That's right. Go <laughs> <laughs> tap, bro. <laughs> Sister, don't you let no Neanderthal, demon, alien, unnatural, only been civilized for 1,000, 3,000 year, devil crawl up into your heaven. Devil ain't got no business in heaven. And black woman, don't you give him your heaven because he's still a white supremacist, whether he on top of you or not. And that's why I feel for Serena Williams right now. I feel for Sister Serena. I don't know why she married that white boy. You know why? Because white people beat her up so much. White people verbally abused our sister. Have you ever read the reports on Serena at those matches? Yeah. They called her monkeys. Yeah. They said she was a man trapped in a woman's body. They said somebody needs to test her DNA. They said somebody needs to take off her underclothing, brothers and sisters, and make sure she was a woman, not a man. Yeah. Read it and make you want to cry. Serena Williams had to deal with that for over 20 years. So the white people made her feel ashamed to be who she was, and she felt the only way she could rescue some semblance of her beauty is to let a white man crawl up into her heaven and give her a half God, half devil child. I'm not picking on my biracials in here. If you're biracial, you're still African. I don't make a bit of difference between you. You want to work at my school? If you can stay consistent with the principles of Pan-Africanism, I ain't got no problem with no biracial brothers and sisters because it ain't no such thing as being half white. Any Negro calling himself half right is really half crazy. The African DNA is predominant. Whatever we mix with becomes us. If a black man lays with a white woman, that is not a half black baby. That is a 99.99999 African child. That's right. In fact, that's why they hate you, black man. Why they hate you so much unemployed? Why they hate you so much miseducated? It's enough of us in jail, they want to put more of us in jail. Enough of us been murdered, they want to murder more black men. You know why, black man? Because you're the only man on earth who can reproduce himself in the womb of any other woman. Only the black man. Only you. Of course the white woman is attracted to you. Of course the Chinese woman is attracted to you. By nature, weakness craves strength. And so your melanin releases cyber chemicals that when they are sniffed by white women, and sniffed by Chinese. She wants to feel what it's like to be with the original man. White men don't hate you because of your genetic size. Because not all black men are blessed. The sisters will to testify to that. Okay, wiener? Everybody ain't blessed. It's not your size that the white man fears. It's your genetic strength. He hates the fact that you can touch his daughter and make you, but he can't touch your daughter and make him. Racism ain't about money. Racism ain't about hate. Racism ain't about ignorance. Racism is about white genetic survival, brothers and sisters. 
White genetic survival. We can, re we can reproduce them out of existence, although you shouldn't. And black man, you got to get over this white woman thing. I know it's a self-esteem booster. It's like Obama was, but you got to get over it. If you need light-skinned sisters, we got light-skinned sisters. You need lemon sisters, we got lemon. You need her to look just like she white without a DNA test, we got them. You want butter almond, we got butter almond. You want butter pecan, we got butter pecan. You want caramel, we got caramel. You want sweet brown sugar, we got sweet brown sugar. You want maca latte. You want deep black gold. And then some sisters got like a gold with a tan with a bronze. Damn! What do we call that? Neapolitan. <laughs> you ever see the sister? She's standing in the sun, she gold. She go in the cold, she tan. Get in the beach, she bronze. Damn. <laughs> so if you need little lemon, we got little lemon because some brothers like the thin sister. Nothing wrong with that. Or you could come all the way over here and get full figured fudge. <laughs> Shout out to the full figured sisters because brothers know. Ain't no lover you get like you get from a full-figured black woman. Yeah. Yeah. That's right! Full-figured sister. And they know how to cook. White women don't know how to cook. We season white man's food. You don't believe me? When I go to China, that food nasty. The only reason why the Chinese food in Detroit tastes good because we taught them how to season it. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. We've seasoned everybody's food. White folks don't know how to cook. They was eating raw meat. That's right. When the Iceman came to the Sunland of Africa, he was eating raw meat. And our great, 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 great grandmothers would go up to those white women and say, excuse me, baby, that ain't what you do. That meat got germs in it. You got to cook it. The hell is wrong with you damn Neanderthals? <laughs> And then grandma would, would start a fire. This is what we did. We civilized the devil. We should probably left him uncivilized. And we told him how to put some paprika, some jerk sauce, little salt and pepper, little Cajun Creole season. <laughs> get them ribs. We taught them how to cook. And then grandma said, go get my, 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 my shaver. And we come back with the shaver that we used to make, traditional African. And you said, okay, baby, because women don't go around with hair on their back and shoulders. So we're going to shave your hairy ass back. <laughs> and then we had to get them underarms real good. <laughs> then you told her what a bra was, underwear, menstrual cycle. This is all real, y'all. They did not wear underwear until we introduced it. And they live with they did not use soap. White people use spice. Why was Christopher Columbus looking for the new world? Christopher Columbus was looking for spices because back then the royal family didn't take baths. They would rub up in spices. It wasn't for food because they food ain't got no damn spice. The spice was for funk flavor. That's right. They talk about wheat steak. Smell your ass. So I told you, brothers and sisters, you better not swallow that LGBT pill. Because now they didn't extend the label. Now, brothers and sisters, you ain't just got to worry about LGBT. They now got LGBTQIP. Heterosexual. Let me tell you what the P is. See, for those of y'all have been following me, y'all know how to gay y'all this game years ago. And y'all said I was a conspiracy theorist, and now it's on your front step. Remember, homosexuality was a mental disorder until 1974. Right. And people never thought they would make homosexuality legal. They're about to make pedophilia legal. They've introduced a, listen, they've introduced a motion in the American Psychiatric Association to change the classification of pedophilia to pedosexual. They said pedophilia criminalizes men who have an attraction to kids they cannot control. We should not punish them, we should understand and treat them. So they said, we don't want pedophilia, we want it to say pedosexual. Don't treat it like a disease, treat it like a sexual orientation. If you don't believe me, do your research. That's right. They want to make it normal for men to have sex with kids. 
because that's what they do. Not all white folks are gay, not all white folks are pedophiles. I would never say that. But the history of those movements grew out of Greco-Roman culture. Because they viewed the woman as unclean. That's why Napoleon was gay, Alexander the Great, Plato, uh, Socrates, Caesar. All of them were homosexuals. Because the woman was dirty, so they said we should have sex with each other so we could stay godly. That's right. You don't believe me? In psychology, guess what we were taught? All the fathers of white psychology said boys having sex with other boys is a natural, healthy part of adolescent development. Sure yeah. did. They teach that today. They taught me that. But you think the pedosexual, you still ain't done. They got something else, Bobby, they working on now. You got to go from P all the way to Z. You damn right, zoophilia. Sex with animals, zoophilia. No, they said you don't call it bestiality. That's not sensitive to people's needs. It's zoophilia, sister. It's zoophilia. Did you know two states in America passed laws in the past five years to punish people who have relations with animals? That's right. In Europe, they have animal brothels where you can pay to go lay with an animal. You walk into the room, and the poodle got a thong on. <laughs> Cut it out, Bob. <laughs> I'm not lying. Google. Animal brothels are legal in many European countries. See, when they destroyed Michael Vick's career for fighting dogs, y'all didn't know what's going on. Y'all didn't know what was going on. They destroyed Michael Vick for fighting dogs, not because he killed dogs. White men kill black men and go home, but he go to jail for dogs. Mm -hmm. Because when you killed the dog, you didn't kill man's best friend. You killed the white man's boyfriend. <laughs> you wonder why they sleep with the dogs? Dogs all in the bed. Tongue them. <laughs> I used to have a little pit bull, right? I look outside my window, white boy next door is tonguing my puppy in my yard. I said, Neanderthal, get! <laughs> I'm telling y'all the truth. They want to legalize relations with animals. That's why these white girls be teaching them how to eat and wear clothes. Y'all see them on them shows. My dog can drive. My dog can cook. My dog can wash themselves. My dog can go shopping. My dog can check my email. My dog can bend me over. <laughs> Anybody who think I'm making this up, you got a homework assignment. I want you to do your research on the order, origin of gonorrhea and chlamydia. There is a theory from white folks that says gonorrhea and chlamydia came to be an STD by way of human contact with animals. And if you do your research on diseases in Africa, there was no gonorrhea or chlamydia in Africa before our contact with That's a fact. I'll give you another piece of homework. Prove me wrong. In colonial America, 17th century to 1600s, one of the top reasons for criminal persecution was sex with animals. Who want to go find a white girl now? Uh-huh. Some of y'all brothers got the white girls with three puppies in the house. Those are three damn men. And you wonder why he barking at your ass. That's my damn hoe. Stop laughing. This is a clinical psychological lesson. Don't come in here. He got his Tim's on, batting his head. Let him bang, bang that door again. You in there kissing on her, he barking at you. Brothers and sisters, as we prepare to rap, I want to say that we got some work we got to do in 2018. Every last one of you have to become a part of an organization or start one. Marcus Garvey said the greatest weapon used against the Negro is disorganization. Stokely Carmichael said if you organize a little, you get a little done. If you organize some, you get some done. If you organize a little, if you organize a lot, you get a lot done. 
We ain't organized at all. And stop looking for coalitions with Jews and Latinos. Black folks is crazy. We need to unite with the Abrahams. Arab don't like you. I grew up at 8th in Susquehanna, in North Philly. I grew up inside the Masjid Mecca that the Nation of Islam used to own in North Philly before the revolution came in 75, I think that was. And when I would go to Juma with my daddy, the Arabs would wear leather socks to make sure their feet didn't touch black people. And then when we would line up for prayer, the Arabs would move their feet away from ours. They didn't even want to touch you in prayer. And in Islam, you're taught that the, the, the shoulder's supposed to touch and the feet supposed to touch because it's believed that the devil or the demons are getting between y'all. So y'all got to touch and lock up like brothers. But the Arabs wouldn't do that. They would keep moving their feet. And it took me as a child to come to the realization, because I didn't understand white supremacy yet, that the reason he kept moving his feet is he didn't want to touch me because he considered himself better than me. That's right, brothers and sisters. Nobody likes you, nobody coming to help you, and we don't need it. We can do this ourselves. Yeah. And if you ask me, Dr. Umar, why is the white man here? Who created the white man? The reason for the white man is to prove, to make you prove that you are worthy of God's grace. The white man was put on this earth to be your competition. He is your natural enemy. God gave you everything in Africa and gave the white man nothing in Europe. God gave you nothing but melanin and made him a pale man. You are his natural adversary and he's going to keep killing you and whipping you behind until you manifest your God self and put him back in his place. No child supposed to tell a parent what to do. Brothers and sisters, we got to stop the infighting. We absolutely do. Yes, we do. I know I talked about God is not sheeted today, but I'm not bringing him up no more. I'm done with it. It's a new year. I got to move on. I got to focus on this hearing on Monday. Get ready for Japan and China to come back and hopefully find a school before January out. I need that school before they seize our funds. So that's what we're working on right now. I'm praying to God every day. Get me to school, Lord. Just get me this. I'll make the rest happen. Get me that building. It's coming. And for those of y'all who've been loyal to me and stuck by my side, you mean a lot to me. Some of you fair weather friends, though. Y'all like me when y'all see me, and then I see you on Instagram making comments about me yesterday. Half the people tearing me down that you actually wanted to work with me, and when they did not get what they wanted, became a hater. I remember back in the day when your enemies were honest enemies. They let you know they didn't like you, and they simply stayed away. We don't have that no more. We have a whole society full of frenemies where I'm going to act like I like you to see if I can get what I want from you. And then only when I realize you are on to me, then I'm going to stab you in the back. Coon is the new black. And I'm going to tell y'all something else. Y'all better stop making kids with coons. Black women don't make another baby with a coon negro. And black women don't make another, and black men don't make another baby with a coon woman because when you have relations with a coon, you produce a half coon child. That child come out buck dancing shit with a hat. You need revolutionary men with revolutionary women. And when I say revolution, they don't mean guns. The revolution begins in mind first. Black people got to change the way they think before they can change anything else. That's right. This got to change first. If I don't change this, Forget the rest. And that's why FDMG is so important. That's why FDMG is so very important. That's right. We can break the curse of slavery. But yeah. first we got to recognize that the white man ain't God. And how can you recognize that the white man ain't God when he's still hanging up on your wall as God? Mm. Some of y'all still got a white Jesus today. Mm. In Chicago, excuse me, in Detroit, white Jesus. Grand Rapids, Kalamazoo, Flint. Jesus is white as hell. And then some of y'all cheat and go down to the Christian store and come back with a Cablin Asian Jesus. Look like little Richard. <laughs> Still got a perm and lipstick on. Just suntanned out, but you ain't never got no, I barely see a Jesus with a nappy head in the black house. Mm. Barely. And I want y'all black women to learn something real good. Some of y'all say, Dr. Uma, I don't use perm. And by the way, I learned when I was in China last year that Chinese women ain't allowed to use the perms that they sent over here for y'all to use. Because right. mm -hmm. it's too toxic to the scalp. Right. Black woman, stop killing yourself to look white. And I'm going to tell you something else, sister. I want you to stop getting these liposuctions and body suctions and gastro bypasses. That's right. Okay? Listen, ladies. Listen. First law of beauty for black women. And by the way, I'm working on my sisters only book. First law of beauty is the size of your head. 
need to match the size of your body. Small woman got a small head. Big woman, big head. Medium woman, medium head. When you see a big head on a small body, something artificial has happened. It don't match. And you think you look good with it because you can fit in white women's clothing. But it don't look right to men. Because when you got a 20 gallon head, <laughs> in a six ounce body, you look like a titsy roll lollipop. See, I got a big head, because I was breastfed. If you was breastfed, you got a big head. So I can't get extra skinny, because I look like a smoker. Black woman, stop shrinking your size. If you're supposed to be voluptuous thin, if you're supposed to be medium thin, some sisters are naturally small, that's you. But ain't nothing worse than a sister who got a little size trying to get teeny. And then when y'all get teeny, you lose all your curves and piss me off. <laughs> Leave it alone. <laughs> Brothers and sisters, as I prepare to wrap up, if you don't have your passport, please get it. Because one day you might got to fly up out of here 24 hours or less. And this white man stay messing with somebody. Sooner or later, somebody going to come get him back. Number two, I want you to think about going to Africa with me this summer. We're going back to Senegal and South Africa, where we went two years ago. And the reason I'm going back to Senegal is because that's where my spiritual epiphany took place 12 years ago on Gory Island when I poured some libations down in a female slave dungeon and got back to my hotel room in broad daylight. My room went black, started spinning. I started hearing the screams of our ancestors and the whips of slave masters. Started experiencing coincidences. The number 1111 started following me, and then I visited Nat Turner land for the first time, Baba, unexpectedly on 11-11-11, only to find out that Nat Turner was hanged on November 11th. Mm. Coincidences are the ancestors letting you know that you're on the right path. Right. I was in Houston yesterday. I looked up at a sister. I said, what time is it? She said, it's 11, 11. Mm. This is 2018. Two plus zero plus one plus eight is 11. Perfect synchronicity as above, so below. We got work to do, brothers and sisters. We're going to Senegal and we're going to South Africa. If you've never been to Shaka Zulu grave site, you can come see it with me. If you've never been to the place where they made the Shaka Zulu movie, you can come see it with me. That's right, if you've never been to Soweto, where the South African freedom struggle took place, you can come see it with me. If you've never been to Johannesburg, if you've never been to, uh, what's the name of the town with Cecil John Rhodes in southern South Africa, what's that town? Uh, no, that's the country. Kimberly, where they got the world's famous diamond, Kimberly Diamond. You're going to get a chance to see that where you're going to see this big, giant mine where they made black men and women dig the mine with their hands. It's almost 100 feet deep, and it was made with their hands. And they said sometimes people would fall all the way down, Baba, looking for, for diamonds for the white man, and they wouldn't even pull them out. They left them down there. You think we've been through something. Where do you see what they've been through? We all caught hell globally. The question is, who is going to wake up to this realization and help put African people back where they need to be? It's our job to do that. It's our job to do that. Brothers and sisters, before I give you my closing quote, I want to ask you to do me a favor. Okay? If any of you have an expertise that I might be able to use if the school ends up in Detroit, I need you to send me that resume. But I also want you to shoot me a text. Y'all have myself say, Doc, I'm a secretary. Doc, I'm a plumber. Doc, I'm an electrician. Doc, I can help you with your meal plan. I'm a dietitian. I'm a nat, because the food gonna be, we're gonna go 80% raw and vegan with the oh, diet. Right. Mm. Yeah. In fact, my New Year's resolution is to not eat no meat or no dairy for 2018. Good for you. Now before you clap. 
I said it was my intended resolution. Because 2016, I didn't eat no meat. 2017, I ate one Philly cheesesteak and it led to about 50 of them. I tried, though. So 2018, I'm going to cut the meat out again. But in addition to the meat, I'm going to try to cut the dairy. Now, that's going to be hard. I can give up the meat quicker than the dairy because it ain't nothing after a good lecture and a long book signing line. Go back to your hotel room with a nice pint of haagen pineapple coconut. <laughs> or a nice Ben and Jerry's Cherry Garcia. Or in the morning, ain't nothing like waking up to some silk coconut milk and a box of Cap'n Crunch. <laughs> or some Fruity Pebbles. Yeah. Or some Honey Cone. <laughs> or some Choco Berries. <laughs> some Sugar Smacks. So I got to give up my morning cereal. I got to give up my yogurt. I got to give up my rum raisin, pineapple, coconut, cherry, vanilla. But I got to do it because I got to get in shape for the boys. If I don't eat right, they ain't going to eat right. I got to lead by example. Brothers and sisters, let me give you a quote. Before I give you that quote, I want to tell you a little story. We'll be done in five minutes. There was a black man by the name of Booker T. Washington. He was born in slavery, West Virginia. He walked to a place called Hampton, Virginia. He couldn't afford to attend Hampton Institute, so he asked for an opportunity to work his way through the academy, which he did. Upon graduation, the president of Hampton Institute got a phone call from a black community in Tuskegee, Alabama. They said, we need a black man who could come down here and teach our Negroes how to make a living after slavery. Booker T. Washington accepted the job. He went on down to Tuskegee. When he showed up, there was absolutely no school at all. So he used a half-finished barn, half-finished church, and old garage. When the first class of students got to Tuskegee, they asked Booker T. Washington, where's the classroom? Where's the food? Where's the kitchen room? Where's the dormitory? Where's the laboratory? Booker T. Washington said, look down, children. You're standing on your school. They pulled up their sleeves, and the students of Tuskegee built their own building fired their own bricks, made their own food, stuffed their own pillows, designed their own clothing. They became so famous for making bricks that the white men of Alabama would come to Tuskegee and buy bricks from the students instead of professional brick-making companies. Booker T. Washington said, I need a science teacher. He heard of a black man out of Iowa, the first of his race to get a doctorate in agricultural engineering from Iowa State University. Born into slavery, castrated by the white family that raised him because they thought he might want to touch their daughter, so they removed his penis from his body. Right. His name was Dr. George Washington Carver. That's right. Booker T comes to Dr. Carver, who at the time was the number one scientist in America. All the cosmetic companies and engineering firms wanted to hire him. He turned them all down. Could have been a millionaire. One of the best brains the world has ever seen. Not black, period. He went to Tuskegee. When he got to Tuskegee, he said, Booker T. Washington, where's my office? Where's my lab? Where's my apartment? Where's the lecture hall? Booker T. said, all I have is what you see. Dr. George Washington Carver said, okay. He went to the trash dump of the students of Tuskegee, and he pulled out plastic, aluminum, metal, copper, tin from the garbage. And you know what kind of garbage can be in a college dumpster. And from that garbage, he gave you 300 products from the peanut. From that garbage, he gave you over 200 products from the sweet potato. From that garbage, he's giving you over 500 products from the soybean. Detroit, your problem is not material resources. Your problem is psychological resources. You got the money, you got the degrees, you got all of that, but you ain't got the commitment, the consistency, the unity, and the collective work and responsibility. Your issues are mental, not physical. That's right. How do we come from ancestors who made everything from nothing? And we have nothing, we have everything and have made nothing. Brothers and sisters, Frederick Douglass said, if there is no struggle, there is no progress. 
Those who profess the faith of freedom and deprecate agitation are like men who want crops without plowing up the ground. They want rain but can't stand the thunder or the lightning. They want the ocean, but they're scared of the awful roar of the water. Frederick Douglass said, for 20 years I prayed on my knees to God for freedom, but the good Lord gave me no freedom until I got up off my knees and started praying with my feet. He said, if you want respect from white people, why do you look for pity? The man who pities you will never respect you. The man who respects you has no need for pity. He said, a man may not get all he works for in this world, but you must work for everything you get. And this must be paid for with blood, with blows, or with brawn. But he who wants to be free must strike the first blow. Because the limits of tyrants are prescribed by the people who they oppress. You determine how poorly white people treat you, not them. That's right. Frederick Douglass said, the man who is with the easiest is with the most. He said, but most of all, you remember, power can seize nothing without a demand. I know I'm not related to Frederick Douglass, but my first ancestor who came to America was a black man named Belly, 1701. Brought to Talbot County, East of Shore, Maryland. He married a black woman, Grandma Selah, for whom my six-and-a-half-year-old daughter is named. In 1745, they had Grandma Jenny. In 1774, they had Grandma Betsy Bailey. Grandma Betsy would marry my grandfather, a free black man named Isaac. Although he was free, she was a slave. Twelve children were born, some didn't live long. In slavery, they made us have a lot of babies so we could have a lot of workers out on the plantation. So they gave birth to a daughter named Harriet, and they gave birth to another daughter named Betsy. These two sisters were raped by Aaron Anthony, the white man who owned my family. As a result of that rape, Aunt Harriet gave birth to the greatest black man in American history. His name was Frederick Augustus Washington Bailey. At the age of 20, Uncle Fred ran away from slavery, changed his name to hide his identity. And in 1838, Frederick Bailey became Frederick Douglass. The next year in 1819, his half-brother and first cousin, Dr. Umar's four times great-grandfather, Stephen Henry Bailey, was born. But Grandpa Stephen wasn't so lucky as his brother and cousin. Why were they brothers and cousins? Because their mothers were sisters. And a slave master raped two sisters, so the cousins became brothers. My four times great-grandfather Stephen married my four times great-grandmother Caroline Wilson Bailey, also a slave, who didn't learn to read until 1909, the year the NAACP was founded. When the Civil War started in 1861, Grandpa Stephen went to war with my three times great-grandfather, his firstborn son, George Washington Bailey, the first black public school teacher in Eastern Shore of Maryland. They fought about nine battles in the Civil War, United States Colored Troops of Maryland. Frederick Douglass didn't fight the war, but two of my cousins did, his two sons, Lewis and Charles. They went north to Boston, and they fought with the United States 54th Massachusetts Colored Regiment. If you've ever seen the movie Glory, right. Morgan Freeman and Denzel, that movie's about the sons of Frederick Douglass. But they don't play them by name, which is why you shouldn't get your history from movies. Glory would make you think that that white man who led the 54th was some sort of benevolent white man. But in reality, he was a racist who couldn't stand the fact that he had to lead black men. He used to write letters home to his white parents, regularly referring to us as the N-word, Baba. And you can read these letters in the military library up in Boston, Massachusetts. That movie would also have you thinking that all the black men in glory were escaped slaves. Totally false. Every black man who fought with the 54th was a free black man, free, who voluntarily gave his life and risked his freedom to help his brothers and sisters down south gain theirs. Brothers still got to the Philadelphia Underground Railroad house. There was a man already working in that house, and he was the seventh bishop of Richard Island's African Methodist Episcopal Church, and that's my four times great-granduncle, Bishop Alexander Wayman, the seventh bishop of the AME Church. He the first one who started that Underground Railroad in Philadelphia. So they got married and they gave birth to Grandma Caroline. She moved to Philadelphia from Maryland. She married a Spanish, excuse me, she had a daughter named Vivian. My great-grandma Vivian married a Spanish-speaking Cuban immigrant, my great-grandfather Cicero. And that's how the Baileys became Miles. And then they had my Grandma Ida, who's still alive. And Grandma Ida met and married James Johnson, my grandfather. And they had Jamal, my father, who met and married Barbara in North Philadelphia. And on August the 21st, the anniversary of Nat Turner's war, the anniversary of the Haitian Revolution, 
the anniversary of the George Jackson War, the first day of slavery in America, the anniversary of the Frederick Douglass Fugitive Slave Convention. And guess what, Christian brothers and sisters, according to some of your scholars, Jesus the Christ was born on August the 21st, a Leo like the rest of us. I came forth in North Philly to do two things, free my people and give white supremacy hell. And whether you for me or not, I'm going to do my father's right. work or die trying. Amen. Marcus Garvey said, without confidence in yourself, you are twice defeated in the race of life. But with confidence, you have won even before you have started. Detroit, Michigan, thank you for coming out. We are going to do... A book signing line, and I wonder if I should do it in the hall, since it'll be difficult for them to come up here. Okay. We should do the hallway. Before I go to the hall and before you go, remember the best things come to those who wait, right? Bring it over to me, Brother MOI, please. I got a couple of raffles I'm gonna pull out. I'm gonna do a couple of them tonight because y'all came out in the cold for me. If I pull your name, you're going to come and get your raffle. Come and get your ticket. For those of y'all who came with printed tickets, okay? If you did not print, you're not in the raffle, which is why I always tell you to bring your printed ticket. If I call your name, you're going to come and get your ticket back, and you're going to take it to my merchandise table, and you will get one free of everything on my table. You will get a white hoodie, unapologetically African, which is unisex, male or female, you will also get a ladies hoodie, which is one of the pink ones. You will also get a flag. You will also get a book. Danielle Washington, is she still in the building? Where's Danielle? Where's Danielle? All right. Uh, how can I get this to Danielle? All right, Danielle, get that. You get one free. Danielle, where you at? Raise your hand, baby. Right there. Let's do another one. Tiffany Knight. Where Tiffany Knight at? Come on up, Tiffany. Love the hat, Tiffany. What kind of animal is that? <laughs> Tiffany. <laughs> Stop laughing. Tiffany Knight.